Good morning and welcome to the In Conversation with Mercy Asset Management Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives in the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you up to Lisa Ward, Head of Portfolio Resourcing. Good morning. Good morning and thank you. Welcome to today's webinar in conversation with Mercia. Designed specifically for our retail investors and our shareholders, this event will introduce you to our range of portfolio companies, talking to the founders and CEOs of some of our exciting direct investments and third-party portfolio companies. This is our opportunity to update you on just some of the businesses across our portfolio and the range of sectors that exemplify the immense innovation and diversity that can be found across the UK regions. From health tech and deep tech to mobile gaming and enabling tech, we want to give you the insight into the sectors and the regional businesses that continue to withstand the most difficult of trading conditions, demonstrating their resilience and our capacity to continue to support this growth. Many of these SMEs are making a significant financial contribution as well as a positive societal impact into the communities in which they are located. With me today is our CEO, Mark Payton, and Julian Vigors, our Chief Investment Officer. Before handing over to Mark, I'd like to just remind you of a few housekeeping points if possible. We will focus on answering questions that we've received through the Invest in Meets company platform. We might not be able to get to them all today. We'll also um, take questions that you have uh, submitted through the Q&A function. If we don't get to all of them, we'll make sure that we come back to them through the Invest in Meet company platform, where we'll provide a uh, written answers. So today's webinar is a combination of live conversations here in our Mercia studio as well as virtual interviews and videos. The entire event is being recorded and will be available to you to view again on the Investor Meet Company website. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Mark Payton, CEO of Mercy Asset Management. Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And welcome, welcome everybody uh, joining us across the country. I'm rather hoping the weather is somewhat better than it is here. It is pouring down. We are in our main office um, in Henley and Arden. Uh, and I just thought I'd give you a brief introduction about Mercia and what we're trying to show and demonstrate today. Mercia started its journey back in 2010 with a, a rather small four million pound fund focused really on addressing the, you know, the lack of capital and support across the UK regions. Roll that forward to today. We've got approximately a billion in assets under management, AUM, and of that, about 300 million is in free, unrestricted cash. And the model that we've been developing over these years is a hybrid model combining third party managed funds. And that's really the focus of today, alongside our balance sheet capital, our proprietary capital. And our balance sheet capital will invest selectively in businesses from within our funds, as well as actually as a limited partner in LP in new funds coming forwards. We invest across England, Scotland and Wales. We have 120 people now at Mercia focused on operations, origination, value creation, value add, and of course, value extraction for our investors' benefit. We have eight offices, as I said, one of which being the Henley and Arden office we are at today. And across those third party funds, we've got um, three asset classes, private equity, debt and venture. And we've got 400 companies across those pools of capital, 260 of which are within venture. And venture is very much the focus of today's discussion. Julian, as you'll hear from in a moment, heads up our, our venture uh, activity across the group. But also you'll hear from Ash, and Ash focuses down onto deep tech. And you'll hear some examples there. And you'll also hear from Peter across our life sciences portfolio as well. And just more specifically about the types of capital that we manage, I think it's really important to just emphasize these funds are evergreen, long dated, long duration capital. And that means Julian and his team can look with some confidence to the future about the capital deployment over time. These funds are not subject to redemptions, etc. And the types of capital we manage are broadly in three categories. Retail, so that's, uh, for instance, 
Enterprise Investment Scheme, EIS. You'll hear from Julian Dennard later on in that regard. And Venture Capital Trusts, the Northern VCTs. And you'll hear from Daniela about those. So very important pool of capital in that respect. And then we've got government agency capital. So it's like British Business Bank, um, where we have the great privilege, actually, of managing a number of funds across the North of England and the Midlands. And you'll hear from Will and Ian talking a little bit to that later, too. And then finally, institutional capital. And this is predominantly in private equity and debt. And these are typically regional pension funds, but they're outside of today's discussion. So we won't be dwelling on that too much. And just sort of stepping back and looking at the model that Mercia has developed, it is what we call sort of connected capital, inter interconnected pools of capital. So within venture, we can go in early, pre-revenue, start up young businesses and follow that through with the appropriate risk adjusted capital as we look to scale and grow those businesses. And that um, is really important when you're taking that sort of long term perspective on the businesses you're supporting. I think also in, in addition to that is the fact that our businesses typically, not all, but typically have quite modest capital needs. And that's really important in times of bad as well as good. And what I mean there is that syndication risk is a challenge within the venture community. And that's where, for whatever reason, your co-investors choose not to or cannot support the portfolio company you're in. Because our businesses have capital requests that are pretty much broadly in line with what we have in terms of our interconnected pools of funds and our balance sheet capital, we can support those in times of difficulties as well, as you've just heard reference there from Lisa. And to put that into context, actually, the value that you look for as a venture investor can be seen in these difficult times. And, you know, you look at the pandemic. So when the pandemic came along, Julian actually switched us into investing rather than stepping back. So when others step back, value has a habit of presenting. So during the pandemic, as that kicked off, we actually made more new investments than the year before. And that's because we enjoy to invest through the cycle. We have the privilege and ability with our interconnected pools of capital. And we very much sit, we take a board seat on most of our venture deals, and we sit there as, as an empathetic investor, actually, where we sit alongside our founders, alongside our management team, helping them achieve the value that they're trying to create. And Lisa actually heads up our portfolio resourcing, where we look to build out management teams, build out teams uh, at the board level as well. So you pull all those pieces together, and the competence and capability that Mercia has really had the great privilege of building over these years has resulted in quite the exemplary track record. And that track record really is distilled into numbers. So if you look at it over the last two years, we've benefited from something like 40 trade sales, four IPOs, returning 250 million over that period back to our investors and our shareholders. So I'd just like to thank all of those that are within our funds for the continued support and look forward to hearing more from the team and from the portfolio companies today. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for setting the scene, Mark, and demonstrating our complete connected capital model and how it supports a range of companies at each stage of their life cycle. And more importantly, it's critical that Mercia's strong liquidity will be in the months ahead. So now I'd like to introduce you to our CIO, Julian Vigors, who's going to tell us a little bit more about our progress over the last year. Julian. Thanks, Lisa, and, and good morning to everyone. Uh, so I am going to cover um, uh, briefly some, some of the more important parts of our, our model in more depth. Um, but firstly, uh, just listening to Mark there, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of our ongoing success. You know, it, it, those 250 million of, of exits, you know, they, don't, they don't happen overnight. And they are the culmination of, of many, many years of, of, of hard work and effort from um, right across our team. So as, as many of you know, um, our model um, is to invest uh, from our funds first. We have uh, circa 1 billion of, of AUM now, 850 million or so of that uh, lies within our third party funds. Uh, we also have um, now 65 or so um, talented investment professionals right across the country. Um, and that is really, really important for uh, our deployment uh, locally into the regions. So if you can imagine, you know, the networks from those 65 uh, individuals now, some of them have been with us for you know, five, 10 years plus. Uh, it's those networks and the fact that we're on the ground um, that really enables us to really find uh, those entrepreneurs and those management teams uh, enable us to, to, to deploy our capital. Now, um, our activities are also uh, having effects uh, more widely into the um, ecosystems, particularly the corporate finance ecosystems, but also in, into the communities 
themselves because fundamentally uh, we're finding and, and, and backing uh, high growth businesses which um, typically do create um, more uh, and, and higher quality uh, jobs. So another really important part of our model uh, is uh, Lisa's work uh, in terms of the, uh, the portfolio resourcing efforts. So um, we now have access to well over a thousand um, non-executive directors, operating partners, venture partners, um, and they come from all different walks of life. They are um, in many ways uh, also experienced uh, entrepreneurs themselves. And that group of, of individuals is important to us for a number of re uh, reasons. The first one is uh, it's those sorts of individuals that entrepreneurs typically gravitate to. Uh, so they're important for our own deal flow. They're important for us uh, in terms of our due diligence uh, when we're looking at new deals. Uh, and they're also, I think, critically important to us because uh, these are the individuals that we can uh, add into our portfolio companies um, to help make a difference. So, you know, be it um, uh, on the governance side, on the finance side, you know, perhaps little tweaks uh, to the business model um, on the sales or indeed, uh, you know, on the technology stack. We can find an individual, uh, add them into that company. And again, these can either be um, short term assignments or, uh, or, or more permanent. But importantly, we, we don't charge for those services. So this is a real um, val value add part of our model. So now um, over 250 positions within our um, third party funds. And that does provide us on the balance sheet with um, our proprietary deal flow. So clearly we, we um, enable and, and, and uh, encourage our um, fund investments to go out and seek third party capital. But um, the fact that we have been watching those businesses for you know, perhaps between six months or even up to five or six years gives us an inside track. And again, along the way, we may well have done some of those little tweaks or added into those management gaps um, uh, or whatever along the way. Now, you may have uh, noticed that um, over the course of the last few weeks, uh, we've made three new investments from our balance sheet. Um, and those are Nova Pangea, uh, Unify, both from the Northern Powerhouse Funds, uh, and Axis Spine, which comes from uh, EIS funds. And again, you're going to hear directly from those um, uh, really interesting companies uh, in just a second. Uh, you're also going to hear uh, directly from Patrick um, uh, Olunig, who's CEO of Endreams, and Mike Grant uh, from uh, Warwick Acoustics on the, the progress that those businesses are making. Um, and I think progress and good progress actually was a, was a, was a phrase uh, that I used um, just a couple of months back in the summer uh, at our um, uh, recent results. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that you know, that phrase, good progress, is, is still the case uh, across our portfolios in spite of perhaps some of the, the more turbulent times that we're, uh, we're seeing at the minute. The last point I want to make uh, in terms of our model, which is very important, is um, across our balance sheet, uh, we are very well diversified, uh, both in terms of stage of business, but also in terms of sector. So, you know, we have games businesses, we have software businesses, life sciences, medical technologies, deep technologies within our portfolio. We're not um, so exposed uh, to consumer internet at this point or indeed the public markets. Now that uh, alongside, as, as Mark and Lisa have already alluded to, the significant liquidity that we have um, between our funds and um, our balance sheet um, does put us in a, in a really good position uh, going forward to make and continue to make those those really good returns for you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Julian. So I'd now like to welcome uh, Peter Dines, Mercia's Chief Operating Officer and also our Managing Director of the National Venture Funds. Peter will share more about Mercia's strength in life sciences sector and showcase our track record with some of our life sciences portfolio too. So Peter, it's great to have you with us today. Thanks, Lisa, and good morning, everyone. And it's my, it's my pleasure to have a role at Mercia to, to oversee our, our national ventures side of the business, which is primarily our, our EIS and our VCT funds, which is a, a key part of the business and, and a fast-growing um, part of our, our business. Um, as Lisa said, I'm, I'm also involved in, in life sciences businesses. I've got a background as a, a medical device entrepreneur, 
and I work with a talented team of, of investment professionals to, to focus on a number of life science and, and health tech businesses. And um, what I'd like to do this morning is, is just share a bit more detail on, on some of that, our approach in this area. As mentioned, uh, Julian just mentioned in terms of our, our network, that, that's a key part for us in terms of how we do things maybe slightly differently. Um, so we've, we've got in, involved with a number of our network of non-execs and operating partners that, that are key parts of our deal flow. Um, and we also, because of our model in terms of a number of different funds, we, we can get involved at a very early stage, um, literally just um, close to the formation of the company to then provide that partnership approach and empathetic investors, as, as Mark said, um, to support the, the growth, both in terms of our, our networks and also our capital. In terms of the track record, it's, it's been a successful few years. And as Julian said, it takes some time of, of lots of effort to, to realize um, those investments. Um, but I'd, I'd also like to share some, some of the, the most recent um, investment and, and exits that we've had in this sector. So a few examples would be Oxygen. So Oxygen was a, initially an, an early stage synthetic biology business when we first backed the academic founder, Ryan Kaywood. Um, our EAS funds were, were involved right at the very beginning, uh, providing follow on capital and then later on our balance sheet to further scale the business. And we successfully exited that business in, in 2021 to Wuxi. Um, and that was a five times return for our balance sheet, but up to a, a 20 times return for some of the early stage EAS funds. Nate's Vansion is another example of, of utilizing our network, backing a, a founder that, that we'd, we'd previously backed. Um, they grew a, a fast-growing and profitable antigen and antibody um, service business and, and often in investment it's, it's about timing and they were focused on the infectious disease space, very quickly uh, pivoted to providing COVID products and services and we sold that business in, in July 2020, right at the peak of the first lockdown and again for it, uh, it was a return of between 8 and 12 times money multiple. And then more recently, a slightly different business. We, we worked with a, a founder of a company called C7 Health. Uh, we, we founded with Phil, uh, Phil Webb, the, the CEO, a tech-enabled health service business, um, which grew very quickly. And, and we sold this year to uh, in health, the diagnostic provider for up to a 14 times return for, for those early funds. The other thing I think that, that's key to, to say in, in all of these transactions is that we sold to a significant premium to holding value. So it, it recognizes that actually there's intrinsic value in, in, in what we're doing as well. In terms of our current portfolio, a number of interesting businesses that are coming through the portfolio. Um, Locate Bio is an orthobiologics business that originally spun out of Nottingham University. And it now has our EIS funds, our, our Midlands Regional Fund and follow on capital from our, our VCTs and, and also our balance sheet funds. Sense Biodetection is, is an interesting molecular point of care technology business, which again has our EIS and balance sheet funds invested. And as mentioned earlier, Access Spine is, is the most recent addition to both our balance sheet um, funds and, and also our VCT portfolio, having um, been seeded initially from, from our EIS funds and with follow on capital. And at this point, I'd like to pass over to Daniela, who's one of our key members of our investment team who also has a, a, um, a focus on life sciences to hear more. Thank you, Peter, and good morning. Uh, I'm an investment manager at the Mercia Venture Capital Trust. We provide scale-up capital to innovative businesses developing new technologies across a variety of sectors. The VCTs invest 40 to 5 to 50 million pounds per year in 15 to 20 businesses that are typically several years into their journey and have early commercial traction. Mercia's EIS and regional funds support startups in their first and second round of funding, while the VCT team can follow through at later stages, investing three to five million in funding rounds of total size of five to 20 million. The VCTs are also able to follow on in subsequent rounds this completing Mercia's connected capital vision as the businesses grow bigger. We will now see a short video about one of our portfolio companies, which has been backed by Mercia since its very inception. 
Axis Spine Technologies is a medical device company focused on advancing surgery of the lumbar spine. The company was developed with founder Jonathan Arcos as a Mercia home group with a strategy to develop a U.S. market-focused spinal implant company that will be an attractive acquisition, to tar uh, acquisition target to a major player. The company has recently completed an 11 million investment round in which Mercia provided circa 7 million split between the VCTs, EIS and proprietary capital teams alongside a 3 million investment from a US specialist venture capital fund called Medtex. You will now see the video and I will hand you over to Will Clark afterwards. The Axis modular technology is trying to deal with an unmet clinical need. That need is cage subsidence. We're focused on interbody fusion and interbody fusion of the lumbar spine and all of our technology is approaching the spine through the front as opposed to through the back as per most traditional technologies in, in spinal surgery. There are a number of benefits for anterior surgery of the spine. Patient recovery is much faster because there's no cutting of muscles and the surgeon is able to obtain a much better correction of the patient's spine and achieve superior spinal balance. So our first technology is an ALIF, anterior lumbar interbody fusion, and we'll be following that product up with lateral and oblique versions so that the surgeon can address the entire lumbar spine through a variety of anterior approaches. What I have learned in 25 years of working in spine is there aren't that many truly disruptive and game-changing technologies that are being taken to, to market. The surgeon's reaction to it made me see that this is an opportunity that surgeons are, have actually been waiting for. Okay, so a patient that's going to be going through an anterior lumbar interbody fusion or, or an ALIF, so the surgeon first off is approaching their spine through the front, through their abdomen. And why are they having that surgery done in the first place? Well, we have discs in between the vertebral bodies and with time those discs can become damaged or just become degenerate. And as they lose fluid, they lose height. And in losing height, the nerves start to get compressed, causing the pain. And they're often losing some alignment as well. So with age, we start to tilt increasingly forward. Current technology involves placing a sort of one piece cage in between the vertebral bodies to achieve that sort of uh, height and, and angle. And if that's a one piece device, in order to get that in through the narrow gap, the surgeon's got to hit it pretty hard. And in hitting it hard, the implant itself damages the structural integrity of the bone. So what we've done at Axis is we've developed a modular technology that allows the surgeon to first place the end plates of the device in a much shorter uh, fashion so that much less force is required in order to insert it. And then when it comes to placement of the core, the surgeon is able to deliver this with a very straightforward wedge within a wedge concept. The surgeon then carefully and in a controlled, precise fashion achieves the increase in height and increase in angle with minimal force, minimal damage, and as such, the correction achieved is better maintained than with conventional technology. Globally, the market for anterior lumbar cages is estimated about one and a half billion. We're focused on the US market right now, which is about 800 million of that. And that's for each of the three approaches that we're developing technology for. Today, we have the direct anterior, the ALIF, and over the next two years, we'll be launching lateral as well as oblique versions of that technology. And so we will have a portfolio that can address that full one and a half billion market. Apart from their out of the box work uh, done on the actual product, John also, early on, saw the opportunity of using virtual reality as a platform for engagement and education. So what we're able to do now is to host meetings where we invite surgeons to our virtual quarters. They can be anywhere in the world. And we have a deep dive into the technology, explaining exactly how the product works, how it's different from our competitors. They can see 
the technicalities, they can see all of the features, they can even put their head inside of the implant. And it gives them a much better overview of what is so different about this device and, and how it works. It's also very, very efficient. And we can see multiple people in a day from the different parts of the world. We're a British company focused on the US. So it saves a huge amount of time. It saves a lot of cost. So what's been great at Axis is seeing some of the top minds in Global Spine embrace the technology, validate some of the key differentiators of this technology, and become excited in what this can represent for their patients. And hearing the patient testimonials of how patients are leaving hospital within hours of the surgery, and again, touch wood, are doing fantastically well and maintaining their corrections. That's satisfying. So in closing our Series A, the business is very well funded. We've got at least two years cash runway, which gives us time to prove the technology, both clinically as well as the preclinical testing that we've done to date. It allows us to complete the development of the lateral and the bleak offerings, and then really drive commercial adoption of that portfolio product to place us as one of the leaders and one of the drivers in anterior lumbar surgery. Thanks, Daniela, and to John at Axis Spino. Really is fantastic. I'm not sure you really need to hear anymore. But good morning. I'm Will Clark, MD of Mercia's Regional Venture Activity. You've already heard from Mark and Julian this morning how Mercia is now positioned as a national investor with an active and expanding regional footprint. And in an increasingly competitive market, we're continually asking ourselves why Mercia? to make sure we remain a valuable and relevant manager, both for our investors and our investees. And what I'd like to do now over the next few minutes is provide you with a real insight as to Mercia's regional managed funds activity. You've probably heard before, we're in the regions, we're from the regions to the regions. Some of us maybe sound a little bit more like that than others, but bluntly what this means is we see deals that others don't. Our managed regional fund activity is an integral part of Mercy's ability to find businesses with genuine product and international market fit, and which may go on to require further scale-up, risk-adjusted capital from Mercy's EIS, VCT, and balance sheet. The key to this is strong deal origination. So as well as being active with digital deal origination campaigns, and regular online initiatives, which you might have seen on LinkedIn, such as Meet the Funder. There are two key factors, which I think are really worth highlighting at this point. Firstly, I'd like to call out the effort of our local teams, the guys and girls on the ground who are working the patch. It's them who are attending the early morning business briefings in Barnsley or the nighttime networking events in North Alberton. But they're the ones who are forming relationships and shaping deals developing conversations with those leaders we want to get to know in their locality. And of course, it's far easier for Mercia to do this with our uh, regional spread, rather than just heading up the East Coast main line from London once a fortnight. I think the second most important thing is our network. This really does make a difference. And I'll just call out again the work that Lisa does in leading our Mer Mercia Nucleus Initiative We've got an active NED and CXO network. And these networks comprise experienced, successful people who we call real friends of the house. And they regularly do two things for us. Not only do they signpost business leaders to Mercia who are looking for investment, but they're also very willing, as Julian said, to take a phone call and provide a view on a particular investment opportunity or investment thesis. And I think this strong deal origination is borne out in our deployment numbers. And you may be interested to know that over the last two years to set the end of September, Mercia's regional managed funds alone have invested in excess of £50 million in 109 transactions, supporting 83 UK regional SMEs. So let me now introduce you to three of our superstars and my senior investment colleagues, 
and we'll be able to showcase our capabilities from the northeast to the southwest, encompassing a range of sectors. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to Ash, who's based in Manchester, and Ash leads our deep tech investment activity, and we'll be sharing more information about our track record in deep tech and introducing you to our portfolio business, Unify. Thanks, Will. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashwin Kumaraswamy. Uh, I'm an investment director with Mercia, focusing on deep technologies uh, businesses. Um, Mercia, as an investor, is uh, proactive in more ways than one. Um, primarily, we look at uh, providing complete connected solution, finance solutions, but also um, the other end of the spectrum, uh, we create companies um, um, that shows our entrepreneurial nature, where we bring ideas and teams together uh, and, and help create businesses from scratch. Um, and one such example is Faradian. Um, Faradian is a business that Mercia co-founded um, in 2010. Um, we've been involved in the business uh, from recruiting uh, uh, team members uh, right through to um, helping the business fund uh, at various stages, eventually um, helping the business uh, be acquired by Reliance Industries um, uh, early part of this year. And this entire journey of uh, creating companies from scratch um, right through to building value um, is unparalleled um, in, uh, in UK uh, venture capital spec uh, sector. In terms of deep technology focus of Mercia, uh, we've been probably one of the longest serving uh, deep tech enthusiasts um, in, in the country. Um, and, and one such example of uh, a new deep tech business that we are involved in is a company called Unify, which you will shortly see a video of. Um, uh, Unify is all about uh, transforming human machine in, in, in interface, uh, where it can turn any industry standard um, plastic or a smart or plastic or a glass surface into a, a, a smart touch display um, um, and we can also add things such as haptics and other you know, features to it um, and then selecting these companies as early as possible and nurturing them is where the strengths of Mercia lies. Um, uh, now uh, you'll see a video of um, uh, Unify and I'll post that, I'll hand over the victim to Will Clark. The best way to describe the capabilities of our products is wherever there's an opportunity for a human machine interface, we believe there's an opportunity to use our technology. Unify is responsible for providing uh, a very different uh, uh, take on touch sensing. So if you take the mobile phone, well, one of the limitations of the technology associated with this is that it's applicable to flat surfaces. What we do is enable this kind of experience on three-dimensional surfaces. The other thing that we do which is really uh, important is that we provide effectively what's referred to as a smart surface platform. Once again I refer to the fact that this is a particular type of smart surface. We provide three-dimensional smart surfaces that you can have physical objects integrated into them but you can also start combining other HMI features. Our technology consists of simply two layers of an optical decoupler. The first layer of which is our transmission layer. Light is injected using our optical technology through a aperture. It energizes a plastic, uh, which allows a certain amount of um, light to be encapsulated through total internal reflection. When a user comes to touch this layer, their finger disrupts the evanescent field in doing so, in, di in disrupting this layer of light, it's then projected downwards. Now between the TX and the RX layer here uh, is an optical decoupler. The light then enters this next layer of plastic. This is picked up by our algorithm and then it gets translated into a location, but actually more importantly, an equivalent amount of pressure. So this gives us two really salient bits of information. So with that information, we can create some quite immersive gestures that allow for a very unique user experience, which is hard to get with other technologies. We can show you here the sort of dashboard from all the sensors, if you like. Um, and what you'll see here is these corresponding segments around these, these parts are actually the cells which are divided up here on the RX plate. So when I introduce my hand, it will disrupt 
the evanescent field over the TX layer and it will fire down into the RX layer. Unique with our technology, if I squeeze, you can see the colors of the LED change. Now, this is not apparent um, with every technology you come across, like in mold electronics. This is what makes our technology quite unique. There are huge opportunities. The biggest challenge that, that Unify has is, given the fact that we start with the idea that we can be integrated into just about any product that someone will physically interact with, I would say that as a start point, in terms of volume, you'd be talking two or three orders of magnitude more volume than is currently associated with a combination of tablets and smartphones and displays. So it's a huge market. Boiling it down, you've got automotive, for example, 80 to 100 million vehicles. But just imagine if the sculptured interior of your car, that is the door panels, right? Uh, the armrests, the headliner above, all of that can be made intelligent using our technology. And that's just a car. <laughs> the core patent has been granted in at least five territories, okay? Including uh, China, the USA, and Japan. We've got other patents that in addition to those territories have been granted in, in South Korea. We have about uh, five patents that are at various stages of progressing through uh, the, the grant system. And we've managed to convince all of them that this is just different. So because we're effectively dealing with just two pieces of plastic, and they don't actually have to be molded together at the same time, it could be two separate parts, it's very simple to be able to recycle this. You, you, you can take these parts, disassemble them, recycle them back into the material, which is a key advantage now, especially in automotive. This is a bit of a game-changing technology in that regard, because it means that the part cost is much lower, and the volumes can be achieved in, in, a, in a greater yield, which means that we can, we can get parts out with much more confidence and reliability than our competitors. Now we've got a, a relationship with Hyundai and Group Antolin. Those relationships are in place uh, because both companies have acknowledged that what we are offering is fundamentally different from any other smart surface enabler technology. And the critical thing about Group Antolin, one in three volume cars shipped today has their products in it. So if you can imagine that as being an indicator of where we can be. The thing that I find incredible about uh, uh, Unify is that this is a business that could become highly accretive in a relatively short period of time. I, I, I think that this is a company that can easily uh, aspire to being uh, a unicorn beyond within a few years. And, and there aren't many businesses you can say that of but I think you can say that of Unify. Isn't that one brilliant too? Can't wait to see the options lift of my next uh, next car. But anyway, in true Eurovision, Eurovision fashion, uh, we're on the move. So we're actually going up to go up to Newcastle now and to Ian Wilson, who heads our local Tyneside office. And Ian's going to focus on our credentials in clean tech. Over to you, Ian. My name is Ian Wilson. I'm Fund Principal for Mercia. I work predominantly in the Newcastle office in the northeast of England. The northeast is an interesting place to work right now as it's gone through a fundamental shift in its focus for business. Long gone is the time when the major industries were shipbuilding and coal mining. There's a long tradition of reinvention and regeneration, and now is no different. Now the Northeast is at the centre of the shift to the knowledge-based economy by following a purpose-led impact strategy with decarbonisation, sustainability and green initiatives at the heart of every growth story. There are established success stories including FTSE 100 listed Sage PLC and the electric Nissan Leaf and other forthcoming vehicles are manufactured in Sunderland, complementing what is already a growing renewable energy hub already in place. The Ministry of Portfolio in the region also has the likes of Equiwatt, a business focused on driving efficiency by facilitating the ability for households to reduce their power consumption at peak times. And true, 
a brokerage to help drive down energy costs for SMEs. However, the North East is not alone. The same story could be told in any of the regions in which we operate. Want to introduce a business from our portfolio? I will watch a short video. Tees Valley based Nova Pangea Technologies, AB led by CEO Sarah Ellaby. This is a clean tech business that uses wood and other agricultural plant residues and turns them into various biofuels. So what we do at, at Nova Pangea is we've developed a process called RefNova. What's really unique about, about our technology is the fact that unlike other technologies within sort of that net zero space, we take multiple feedstocks. So we're quite feedstock agnostic. In other words, we can take um, agricultural plant residues, we can take woody residues that we can then convert to our products. We have two product outputs, so we have the, the biochar and the Nova Sugar. So that's quite a big differentiation for us because that delivers a very robust economic model. And we enable, we unlock uh, the likes of sustainable aviation fuel by providing one of our products. And when, and dependent on the use of the biochar, that will then deliver a carbon negative fuel. Uh, which is, you know, a big part of our differentiation. So this is the beginning of the RefNova process. This is the Nova pre-unit, and this is the raw material we get directly from the sawmill. So eventually this will go through the process to produce Nova sugar and Nova char. So this is the wood chip after we've done the particle size reduction. Uh, this has been pre-treated and is now ready for drying before we then put it into the second stage, which is the steam-assisted rapid pyrolysis unit. Our Nova pre-unit that's existing here, we run at about 100 kilos per hour. When we move to Nova 1, we'll be running at one tonne per hour. This is the steam-assisted rapid pyrolysis unit, known as SARP. So this is where we take the processed wood chip, treat it with steam, which sweats out the sugars, and then the sugars go over the top and then also convert the remaining material to the biochar. So this is the biochar. This is one of the major two products we produce. This makes us different to other lignin cellulosic production units. So we produce the biochar and we produce Nova sugar, which is then fermented onto ethanol. And then this biochar is actually sequestrated CO2. So this makes our process carbon negative. This is Nova Sugar. This is the second of our two main products coming from the wood chip. So this process in total takes about one to two hours in total, which makes again makes a big difference to other lignin cellulosic processes. When we move to our new site, we're taking most of this equipment with us and we're going to expand out so eventually the process will produce 6 million litres of ethanol and 10,000 tonnes of biochar. We have a pathway to unlock SAF and we will start to unlock SAF next year. The total addressable market is just under, just under a trillion, so around about 600 billion. Um, we are very focused on uh, carbon removal alongside um, you know delivery of those feedstocks uh, to unlock markets like sustainable aviation fuel decarbonizing these uh, hard to decarbonize sectors such as as, as aviation um, is a big part of our value proposition and the fact that you know, we have a critical pathway to unlock sustainable aviation fuel. We have a partnership uh, with British Airways and Lanza Jet uh, to deliver 113 million litres of SAF in the UK. So that's the equivalent of 190 million litres of uh, bioethanol or second generation ethanol uh, that will be produced through our RefNova technology. We've gone through a couple of stages with uh, British Airways and, and, and Lanzajet. We've just actually signed a joint development agreement with uh, British Airways and Lanzajet to deliver the second phase of the project and BA are actually funding this part of the project of about 1.2 million and that will take us uh, it's a six-month piece of work and that will progress 
uh, project Speedbird and get it to a, a what we call a front-end engineering design stage of the project. What's next for Nova Pangaea? We are moving our pre-commercial plant uh, into commercial production next year. Uh, so we are moving from this building to a new uh, headquarters. We're going to be laying the foundation from a financing perspective which will be absolutely significant for the company. We will be looking at opening up our top tier market which is the US. Looking to deploy the technology globally, uh, obviously internationalising the business and delivery of our strategic roadmap and delivery of what we consider Nova One. Nova One will be a part of the delivery of uh, Project Speedbird, uh, which will come online 2025-26. I mean, it's a very, very exciting, you know, few years ahead for sure. This is something that's never been done. Um, so that, that's a big, big part of my drive, is, is doing things that, that nobody else has done. be at Nova and interestingly Sarah is someone that was introduced by Lisa and through the Mercy and Nucleus initiative. Just in terms of this sort of final section I'd just like to pause for a moment and describe our current fund mandates and as you know Mercy is a, an extremely ambitious business and I'd like to give you a flavour of how we're hoping to grow our assets under management. So we actually secured about 40% of the first generation of regional funds, and Mercia currently is managing three equity funds, three venture funds across the North, the Northeast and the Midlands. And initially these fund mandates provided Mercia with about 108 million of equity uh, capital for deployment. But since then, we've grown these commitments by a further 44 million to 152 million. So 2023 is actually a key year for us. So not only are there further opportunities to expand each of these three current active funds, but following the government's announcement as part of its 2021 autumn statement, there's a next generation of regional funds, which in total will be worth 1.6 billion for both debt, uh, startup loans and equity. And we're hoping that some of these uh, initiatives will be in our preferred regional geographies and definitely hope that Mercia will be in the mix for that. So therefore it should be no surprise that in closing this section we're going to focus on the recent expansion of our physical footprint into the southwest. So given the importance which Mercia attaches to developing local conversations with business leaders and with hubs of tech activity in Cheltenham, Gloucester, Bristol and Exeter we want to ensure that those businesses also benefit from access to Mercia's complete connected capital solution. So thank you. I've enjoyed this opportunity to share more about the people and investment in the regions. We'll have the chance to talk more later in Q&A, but for now I'll hand you over to Julian Dennard, who having been with Mercia for the last five years, is now heading up our new Bristol office. And as you'll hear, as our third superstar, is already doing deals in the Southwest. Over to you, Julian. Hello, my name is Julian Dennard, and I am the fund principal for two of our venture funds, the Midlands Engine Early Stage Fund, and secondly, our EIS funds. In addition to managing these funds, I am leading the expansion of Mercia's business into the Southwest, an area where we have previously not had a physical presence. I'm a big supporter of the region and its businesses. I live in the region and I have been a venture investor here since 2006, during which time I've built strong relationships across the Southwest, which should serve Mercia well as we grow. The Southwest represents an excellent opportunity for us. When you consider the region's sectoral strengths, life sciences, aerospace, composites, engineering, cyber, electronics, and enterprise software, you can appreciate how closely these map to Mercia's investment focus. These differing technologies, the research from regional universities and various established support networks like SetSquared have created a rich environment for startup and scale up activities for early stage businesses. The one element that has been lacking is a depth of regional capital to support them. 
To help us capitalize on the opportunity in the Southwest, we have grown our team to include Adam Watts in our VCT team and Raphael Joseph in our AIS team. This enables us to cover a wide range of opportunities where companies are seeking between 500,000 and 6 million of initial investment, either as a lead investor or as part of a syndicate. Demand for the capital is strong, and we are seeing a lot of very interesting opportunities. One example of these high quality companies is Exeter-based business Rollmapper, a female-led B2B SaaS business in the HR tech space. Rollmapper's platform helps design job adverts and create job descriptions that attract and retain talent. They utilize machine learning, natural language processing, and bias checkers to design job descriptions with inclusivity at their core, promoting workforce diversity. Wellmap has a blue chip customer base and their offering lends itself well to enterprise customers with over a thousand employees, where there is a large quantity of disparate jobs. We are excited about this business for a number of reasons. Firstly, the management are experienced and credible with a passion for their mission. They have already exited businesses in this space. Secondly, whilst at an early stage, they are punching above their weight with clients they are attracting, like Baker Hughes and Sage, a testament to the need and strength of their product. And finally, we are supportive of the overall objective to promote equality and diversity. Mercia's physical presence in the Southwest, a regional underserved by venture, venture investors, enables us to build the close relationships with the local business community and to find and invest in just this kind of highly promising opportunity, opportunities that may well be missed by our London-based counterparts. This local presence in Bristol demonstrates our philosophy of being a national investor with a strong regional presence. Thank you, and I'll hand you back to Lisa. Thank you, Julian. I uh, hope that those uh, short videos gave you a flavour of the breadth and diversity of just some of our portfolio companies, the strength and passion of their leadership, along with the expertise of our investment team. So I'd now like to introduce you to um, Patrick O'Lunig from Endreams and Mike Grant from Warwick Acoustics. And I think we're really just going to be continuing the theme of driving regional businesses. And I'm delighted to talk to you both this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great. Um, good to see that you're, you're both there. Um, both Warwick Acoustic and Endreams are, are revolutionizing the um, customer experience, really, with their innovative products. And they have quality at the heart of what they do. Both companies have made strides in the last 12 months, becoming world-class leaders in their field. So, Mike, if I could just start with you. I know many of our shareholders follow both companies avidly, but if you, for those of you um, who are not familiar with the businesses, it would be great if you could just give us a very quick introduction to the company. Yeah, sure. Delighted to, Lisa. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, Warwick Acoustics is really changing the way that audio and noise control is done in the automotive industry. Um, we have developed a product, a uh, version of an electrostatic uh, transducer, um, which is now qualified for use in the automotive uh, industry. Why is that important to car manufacturers? Well, three things. First of all, uh, uh, it is something that can shape uh, the customer experience inside the cabin. And as car companies move into the electric vehicle uh, era, they're having to redefine how they engage with customers and how they're actually going to uh, uh, put their brands across uh, to customers in a new way. And we can help them do that through both the shape and form of a, uh, transducers that are different from traditional transducers. Secondly, as you can see, this is a very thin, very lightweight a, uh, uh, transducer uh, audio system. And that basically uh, allows the uh, manufacturer to save on weight. It also operates on very low power uh, in comparison to existing systems. And together, that saves significantly in the range that uh, an electric vehicle with a given audio system is, a, uh, is, um, uh, is able to achieve uh, with a given battery pack. And then lastly, uh, this is a bit like uh, the, our colleagues at Unify. Uh, this is made out of some very simple, uh, uh, <laughs> simple but sophisticated plastics. And it's very uh, uh, simple to recycle. It uses upcycled material and it's considerably more sustainable. Uh, than uh, existing uh, technology. So based on those three things, we're really getting huge amounts of interest uh, from uh, the car industry. And then on top of that, we have some of the best sounding uh, audio systems uh, in the world. And that for 
many is just the icing on the cake. So yes, we're making very significant progress towards essentially uh, uh, dominating uh, the world of audio in, uh, in automotive. Great, thank you, Mike. And I'm sure we'll come back to some of those points in a minute, but I want to give Patrick the opportunity just to, to introduce End Dreams. Patrick? Thanks, yes. Yeah, so we're a virtual reality game developer and publisher. We're very close to being the leading, the largest publisher in the world at the moment. Um, we've been developing virtual reality games, VR headsets, since the end of 2013. Uh, the market's taken a while to get going and to grow, but we're suddenly hitting this kind of hockey stick growth at the moment. It's become very, very commercial. Uh, we've got seven projects in development, three studios, nearly 200 people um, very soon. And um, <clears throat> we're seeing some, some very exciting stuff happening in the market. We're starting to publish uh, games from other companies as well as developing our own as we continue to grow and scale alongside companies like Meta, as you probably guys all know, but also Sony, um, HTC. Uh, we're seeing a lot of growth from Pico, who are owned by ByteDance, um, and also lots of rumors that Apple will be announcing something very soon. So it's a very, very fast growing space that's finally finding its feet, and we're, we're in a really good position. Thanks, Patrick. That was one of the points I was going to pick up on with you, actually, because I think for both of you, it could be argued that you've been a little bit ahead of, of your time. Um, and obviously, post-COVID, there's been a huge um, acceleration in the world of gaming and a kind of ferocious appetite for for VR. Um, can you give us an update on the size of the market now, Patrick, compared to perhaps when you first started and then post-COVID? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, COVID, you know, slightly embarrassingly, COVID was incredibly good for the, the video games industry and for, and for VR in particular. Um, you know, we saw a very strong sales. Um, the market's flying. I mean, the Oculus Quest 2, which is the most successful headset at the moment, and now the Meta Quest 2, we believe there's over 15 million units of, uh, of hardware out there being used, and that compares to about 23 million of the new Xbox, uh, maybe 33 of the new PS5. So it's it's becoming properly commercial now. Uh, we remember Boxing Day last year, looking at the App Store and the Apple phone and the number one selling app above, uh, the number one uh, downloaded app above TikTok, above Facebook, above everything else was the uh, the Meta app, which is fantastic. So it started to become very, very commercial. And we're seeing, um, you know, some very, as I said, some very big new headsets launching from uh, from rivals at similar sort of price points. Um, and and it's, it really feels to us, certainly all of the metrics and data that we're getting, that this, this the hockey stick that we've been waiting for for a long time is finally happening. That's amazing. Um, and Mike, coming to you, I, I spotted an auto car last week. You were you were featured in their magazine. Um, and although the quality of your speakers is absolutely um, sublime, lots of people are not necessarily focusing on that as the sort of core feature of the technology, as you've already said. But they focus really more on the sustainability aspects of um, of the speaker systems. Can you tell us a little bit more about that sort of environmental issue that's becoming more and more important to many consumers? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like end dreams. We had a um, COVID was very good for uh, our business in as much as uh, it brought a focus on sustainability. It brought forward the uh, investment plans of car companies to move to uh, electric vehicles. And uh, yeah, we're now moving into a stage where obviously the first generation of electric vehicles are out there. And now what's happening is that the auxiliary systems, as they call it, so the heating systems, the suspension systems, and of course the entertainment systems, they're now being focused on as uh, you know, development uh, opportunities uh, in the way to enhance the capability uh, of those cars. And uh, yeah, as you say, you know, a lot of that is about uh, yeah, improving the customer experience, but a lot of it is also about addressing the net zero question. And every car company, as we know, needs to, first of all, uh, move their uh, the range to a uh, EV by uh, between 2030 and 2035, depending on which country you, you're looking at. Uh, and secondly, start to move towards these net zero targets that are between 2035 and 2050. So hence to be able to provide a solution for a core part of the customer experience. Uh, that is by, not our words, but by uh, the car companies that we're talking to, the only sustainable, 100% by mass sustainable solution that is out there uh, is something that is driving a huge amount of interest uh, in what we're doing uh, at this uh, at this point in time. And although I can't talk about it right now, I'm very hopeful that uh, by the new year we'll be able to make some very significant announcements about turning what is currently a development a uh, technology into a complete and a um, uh, qualified product. 
Great, thank you, Mike. I think you're you're doing my work for me today. So you've already touched on the commercial part. <laughs> Patrick, I'm going to ask the same question to you. Although I'm not a gamer myself, it was really exciting to see Mark Zuckerberg stand up there and announce the Ghostbusters franchise and End Dreams plastered all over the video. How how did you get in front of Mark and and kind of what next, really, in terms of partnerships? Well, I think it's one of the advantages of getting in very early into the VR market. So, you know, arguably we were very early back at the end of 2013, but we've got to build really strong relationships with the whole of Oculus who are now Meta. And, you know, we've got to know the team there as, as well as Sony and the other guys. And so I think Ghostbusters was a good example of, of how we're growing. We're seeing some very big IPs um, you know, coming along, wanting to be involved in VR. Ghostbusters makes a ton of sense because you, you kind of, you're inside the Ghostbusters world. You've got your proton wands, you're chasing ghosts with your friends, four of you running around and it, it's a it's a perfect fit. So um, we, we, we've known Sony Pictures for a while. We work very, very closely with Meta um, across, you know, across all sorts of um, bits and pieces. And we're, I think, seen by them as a very low risk uh, development uh, uh, option for them because we've got a real reputation now for quality and for doing stuff really well. So um, it's it's just a continuation of the relationships that we've been building over the last, um, last sort of seven to eight years. Fantastic. Well, I know you're both um, exceptionally busy at the moment and conversations like this, there's so much to talk about and we could go on all morning, I'm sure. But um, in the interest of time, thank you both very much for uh, joining us today. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So we've come to the end of the time. Uh, we've just reached the top of the hour. We've got a little bit of time for um, questions. Um, so if I, um, perhaps Mark, if I could uh, start with you. We have, um, we've had a couple of questions around um, returns. So um, we'd like to know, if possible, please, the, um, how you balance the returns on the balance sheet versus the third party funds, and then also the impact of that on the share price. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I mean, this, is, this has been part of Mercy's evolution, actually. So you have heard Julian talk a little earlier about when we go into the funds, the duration of our holding time through funds is, is a longer period. So typically on the balance sheet, we look to hold for three to seven years. It can be much longer within the funds. And therefore, the returns within the funds is expected to be higher. And you heard from Peter earlier talking about oxygen, for example, where you had five times return for the balance sheet and circa 20 times for our EIS funds. So actually how we judge that is a, is a blended IRR. So we're typically looking for the balance sheet to be performing at a 15% IRR and the same with the funds. And that's how we sort of switch that across. Mm -hmm. Funds are delivering, balance sheets delivering, the IRR is blended, but the multiples and time can be different. And then you sort of roll that forwards in terms of the context of the share price. And obviously we're focused on delivering the business. So we're working hard to deliver growth on the balance sheet, which is a NAV per share growth. And you can see our results, NAV per share growth going through, growth within the funds, because that's our future pipeline as well. And actually, if you look at our share price in the last few weeks, it's actually started ticking up, which is really good to see. And just in general, the Malay uh, across the public markets has not been great, especially in the small cap space. And although we have gone down over the year, disproportionately not as much as many of the peer group in the broader, broader market cap spread. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, and then we've also got um, a question here that's probably best suited to, to Peter. Um, it's a very technical question, so I think we'll, we'll hand over to Peter for this one. But there was a question around Axis Spine and um, the positives and negatives of the anterior approach to lumbar surgery over the posterior. So I think that the benefits really of what the Axis Spine's approach is versus traditional methods. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's certainly fair to say that most spine surgeons are trained in all approaches. So they 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 change their approach based on the the pathology that they're they're treating. So I suppose sim simply it would be if the surgeon is looking to address the nerve roots. So, so for example, sciatic pain or or the the spinal canal, then they would definitely be going from from the posterior approach. But if they are mainly aiming to go for the disc and the disc de degeneration and, and restore height, as, as you, you heard John talking about, then um, they will often go from the, the anterior approach. Not always, but, but they, they often will. And, and it, it's, it's emerging that more and more surgeons do that approach. The benefit being that actually you don't um, have to go through all the, the very strong posterior muscles to actually get to the front of the spine. So that, that's why surgeons change their approach based on different pathologies that they're, they're treating. 
you, Ted. And then perhaps this is um, our final question for the, for the morning. Uh, Mark, Julian, you perhaps want to, to answer this one. Um, do you think that the macro headwinds in the market will increase uh, the pipeline of opportunities and gen on gen in general terms, how competitive is the market? I'll give a broad one and, and Julian will be more specific. So, so I talked in the very introduction about investing through the cycle and actually some of the businesses and exits we've talked about have been where we've been able to pick value when there's a downswing because unlike other investors, when they step back from a market, actually we focus more tightly into that market. So actually I, I quite like the ups and downs of the economic cycle because we have the privilege of capital that's got a long-term and long-dated approach. But Julian, perhaps some more specifics there. Yeah, I think you're right, Mark. I mean, it, it, is, it is really important to, to invest right across the, the cycles. Um, you know, we've found in the past that these sorts of conditions do, do spawn um, greater entrepreneurial activity. So, you know, for us, it, it's, it's really the focus on, on buying well. So there are, there are some real opportunities out there um, and we're very aware of it. So, so it is a, a key part of our, of our strategy right now. And then um, final question, just following on that, perhaps for you, Julian, what is the ratio of companies that we turn down investing in versus those that are progressed? Yeah, well, so, I mean, I, I guess that the, num the numbers uh, depend on which, which particular pot of capital um, or whether it's debt or equity, but um, we might have a, a, a very strong look at 10% um, you know, of the stuff that comes through, through our doors and, and maybe invest in 5% of, of that or perhaps a slightly slightly smaller um, uh, percentage but you know t typically it's those sorts of those sorts of numbers great thank you so um in the interest of time i think that's probably all that we've got time for for the questions that we haven't been able to get to we will make sure that we come back to you on the investor meets platform um before we sign off entirely i think i'd just like to remind everybody that we will be um announcing our interim results on the 6th of December. That will also be through the InvestMeet company platform and we'll be providing a live Q&A um, from 3 p.m. So if you look out for the details on the IMC website, you'll be able to register for that. So, um, Mark, I think it's just for you now, really, to summarise the key points mm. I think you'd like us all to, to take home. Well, yeah, thank you, Lisa. And, and thank you, everybody, actually, for joining us um, today. I think you've seen that we're on a journey. Um, we're on a journey, a growth journey ourselves, where we're growing assets under management. And you've heard from Will, the opportunities that we're faced with organically in that respect, but also our portfolio, which is both diverse across sectors, but actually commercially relevant in its, in its progress as well. As a group, we're debt-free, we're well-placed, high liquidity, and to Julian's point, that gives us options and optionality as we look forwards to making more investments in businesses and building out the portfolio. So I'd just like to thank all of those that have supported us with our funds, our shareholders, and we look forward to updating everybody at our results, as you just mentioned. So thank you. Thank you very much for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session, as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Mercia Asset Management PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.